All right, we'll also see how hairs grow up and out of through these two layers and we come to the exterior side of the skin as well. So what are our functions of your integumentary system? Um, the first maybe obvious one is that it helps to protect. So your skin provides protection against any sort of abrasion. If you run up against a wall or have some sort of trauma and also ultraviolet light, um, it provides sensation. So your integumentary system has uh, nerve endings and sensory receptors that can detect heat, cold, touch, pressure, pain, um, so it helps to sense things from the exterior environment. Those senses will then travel up to your brain and then your brain figures out what's going on with those sensory receptors and then it initiates some sort of response. Vitamin D production. When exposed to UV light, your skin produces a molecule that can be transformed into vitamin D. It helps with temperature regulation, um, your skin and the layer, specifically the dermis layer in the skin, helps to control the blood flow uh, beneath the skin surface and the activity of your sweat, sweat glands in the skin. And they will help both regulate body temperature. And that has to do with the constriction and dilation of the blood vessels in the skin. Your blood vessels in your skin can become larger to allow more blood to go through, or they can become constricted to keep blood from going through. And that helps to regulate body temperature. Your sweat glands also help to regulate body temperature to try to dissipate heat. Uh, excretion, small amounts of waste uh, products are lost through the skin and in gland secretions. So we'll start with the skin then. It's made up of these two major tissue layers, the epidermis and the dermis. This prefix epi means above, so the epidermis layer will be the most superficial layer of the skin and it will be above the dermis layer. The dermis layer will be your dense connective tissue layer and the skin itself rests on that subcutaneous or adipose connective tissue layer. Um, and again, it's important to note that that subcutaneous tissue isn't actually a part of our skin layers, but we include it in models. So here is the epidermis and the dermis layers of the skin. They interlock themselves, kind of like if you were to put your hands together or fold your hands together, they interlock themselves with these ridges from the dermis layer. And these little ridges are called dermal papilla. And they contain blood vessels and nerve endings in them. What do you guys notice about the epidermis layer? Um, what does it, the epidermis layer not contain that you see in the dermis layer? Does anyone notice that? What's in your dermis layer that's not in the epidermis layer? Nerves. Nerves and also? Is it blood vessels? Yeah, there's no blood vessels up in your epidermis layer. So these dermal papilla contain nerve endings and blood vessels which help give supply uh, to the epidermis layer. So again, they kind of interlock themselves together. This is a histological view underneath a microscope. Uh, of the um, epidermis and dermis layers, it's labeling, there's five different layers in the epidermis itself. And that's, these are some of the layers that it's labeling there. Okay. So let's get to the epidermis, the most superficial layer. It prevents water loss and also helps to resist abrasion. Um, remember we have these um, keratinized stratified squamous cells that are kind of constantly being brushed off. It's known as the cutaneous membrane. It's made up of that keratinized stratified squamous. So these are cells filled with keratin, which is that protective protein that serves just as a protective covering of the skin. And the epidermis is composed of distinct layers. We call these layers strata, and there are five of them in thick skin and four of them in the rest of the body. And the stratum corneum, so we'll work our way through these five layers of the epidermis. The stratum corneum is the most superficial layer. So this will be where all of your dead cells are filled with keratin. Um, we talked a little bit about keratin, how that gives um, kind of protection and strength to this stratum corneum layer. The cells of the deepest strata in the epidermis, so furthest down, they will perform mitosis to be constantly dividing and those dividing cells kind of push themselves up and work their way up these layers in the epidermis. 
So as new cells are formed, they will push older cells to the surface where, where they will be sloughed or flaked off. Excessive sloughing, maybe some of you have dealt with this before, of the stratum corneum cells from the surface of your scalp specifically is called dandruff. There's a lot of shampoos, creams, the beauty industry has tried to make money off of this. Um, maybe some of you have, have had problems with dandruff. So this is just excessive sloughing off of that superficial layer of the stratum corneum. Um, if the skin is subject to a lot of friction, the number of layers of the stratum corneum will greatly increase, produced a thickened area called a callus. Um, I know when I was a kid, I learned how to play guitar. And when you're learning the chords, there's so much um, friction and abrasion that your skin goes through that you start to form calluses on your fingers. Um, sometimes you can form calluses on your feet. Um, so just places where the, the skin will be subjected, subjected to a lot of friction. Over a bony prominence, the stratum cornea can also thicken to form a cone-shaped structure called a corn. So that is a brief overview of the epidermis. And then the dermis layer will be the layer below it. Remember these two layers interlock as if you were folding your hands. So the dermis layer is composed of dense collagenous connective tissue um, containing fibroblasts, adipocytes, and macrophages. This is where we'll find all our nerves, the hair follicles, which will surround the hair, the growing hair, uh, smooth muscles, which will be connected to the hairs to help them stick up on end. Um, during goosebumps. We'll find our sweat glands here, our oil secreting glands, and other lymphatic vessels um, that all will extend throughout the dermis. Um, we'll have collagen fibers located in the dermis. They're oriented in many different directions. You have elastic fibers, and these are all responsible for the structural strength of the dermis and the resistance to stretch so that if you pull your skin up, it just snaps right back down. That's the help of the collagen and elastic fibers. Questions so far? So you're all kind of quiet. Pretty, pretty good so far, okay. Um, some of the collagen fibers are oriented more directions than others, forming what we call cleavage lines. So these are bundles of collagen fibers that are forming specific tension lines in the skin. They will be more resistant to stretch because they're all going in one direction and they're called cleavage lines. Uh, this is really important in surgery because if you make an incision parallel with these lines of cleavage or tension lines, um, these lines will tend to gap less and produce less scar tissue because an, an incision along these lines or parallel to them, the tissue, um, the collagen fibers won't spread apart as much. So during the repair of that tissue, they'll be able to come back together uh, more quickly. If the skin is overstretched for any reason, the dermis can be damaged, leaving stretch marks. Thanks, Daisy. I'm just reading through your comment. Yes, the skin can stretch a lot, but it does heal quickly, especially if you're a kid. I think I've said this before, but kids are like magic. Their skin is fresh, stretching. It can just go right back to normal after it's been damaged. And I'll get to my story about the splinters in a second. I'm glad it healed quickly for you, Daisy. Thanks for sharing that story. Um, stretch marks. When do people get stretch marks? Anybody know? From gaining too much weight quickly or losing too much weight quickly? Yes, gaining and losing weight. So anytime the, the skin is stretched a lot, uh, pregnancy, um, being overweight and then losing weight, there will probably be still um, some evidence of those stretch marks. Good. I've seen it on uh, bodybuilders, like right underneath the armpit between the chest and the arm itself where the meat. Yeah, but yeah, that's very true, especially bodybuilders who maybe aren't as their muscles aren't as big so they've kind of gone back down to size yeah that's really common to see good so this is a look at the cleavage lines and again this has a surgical significance um, here's a look at an incision along the lines of cleavage um, so scientists, medical professionals have been able to determine where these parallel collagen bundles are in the dermis layer. 
they've been able to map them out on a person. So they know exactly where to make an incision depending on what type of surgery they're performing. So again, here's an incision made parallel to the cleavage lines. And again, it'll just be easier to stitch up and it will be able to heal more quickly because the parallel lines will just come back together over that incision. This is an incision made across the cleavage lines. And you can see here, because the lines of cleavage, those collagen bundle fibers will generally want to stretch the opposite way, it'll be harder for that incision gap to come back together and close up um, where that incision was made. So some clinical significance there, interesting. Uh, dermis, the dermal papilla, those are these injections that will interlock themselves into the epidermis layer above them. The dermal papilla will contain blood vessels uh, and the dermal papilla in the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, and the tips of your toes and fingers will be arranged in different parallel curving ridges. And they will be um, significant enough that their shape will overlie the epidermis to create fingerprints and footprints in your hands and toes and feet. We all have different fingerprints, as you know. Um, and I'm sure we've all been fingerprinted before if you've gotten a job. So we all have different fingerprints. And that is due uh, to these dermal papilla that are projecting themselves up into the epidermis layer. Skin color. Um, so again, skin color can be a determination or a diagnostic tool into what could be wrong with the person. But we all know we have different types of skin colors. And we're going to talk about what gives um, people different factors in their skin color. So the factors that determine the skin color include different pigments in the skin, and there's two that are listed here. Um, also blood circulating through the skin and the thickness of the stratum corneum, so how thick that outermost layer of the epidermis is. The two primary skin color pigments are melanin and keratin. Uh, melanin is the group of pig pigments primarily responsible for your skin, your hair, your eye color. Carotene is a yellow pigment found in plants such as squash and carrots. So that's what carotene is. It'll cause a more yellowish or orangish tint to the skin. Uh, most melanin molecules then, this is that pigment that determines skin color or the primary one. They will be brown to black pigments, but some are yellow or reddish. Melanin will also provide protection against UV light from the skin. So melanin is a pigment that will be produced by cells called melanocytes. So this word melanocyte has a suffix in it. Site always means a cell. So a melanocyte produces melanin. Um, the melanocytes will produce melanin during UV exposure and that will cause your skin to darken um, as a suntan. The melanin will be packaged into vesicles. These vesicles are called melanosomes, which move into the cell um, process of melanocytes. Epithelial cells will phagocytize the tip of the melanocyte cell process, thereby acquiring the melanosomes. So this, these, these last two paragraphs were telling you just about how melanin is produced and how it's formed into vessels. This kind of takes you through a summary of that and just to see it kind of right in front of you. So let's take a look at number one. Um, these are melanosomes. They're produced by the Golgi apparatus in the melanocyte. And the melanosomes will move into the melanocyte cell processes in number two. So they're moving out here. The epithelial cells, which are, lo this is showing in number three, they will kind of eat the tips of the melanocyte cell processes. And when they do that, um, the mel melanosomes, which were produced inside the melanocytes, they will then be transferred to the epithelial cells. They'll now become inside of them and they'll cause those cells to change or darken in color. So skin color itself, large amounts of melanin form freckles or moles in some regions of the skin. Um, this can be due to genetic factors. I have a lot of freckles when I'm out in the sun and my daughter has red hair and a ton of freckles. Um, melanin production is determined by those genetic factors, also exposure to light. Sometimes melanin will be produced or freckles will come out more in the sun because um, that's its way of trying to protect the skin against UV light. Hormones might also have an effect with this. 
uh, genetic factors will be responsible for the amount of melanin produced in different races. So all races, all people have about the same number of these melanocytes in general. So we've, regardless of your skin color, we all have about the same number of these melanin producing cells, but the differences in skin color are determined by the amount, the kind of melanocytes and just the distribution of them. So that is what produces different skin color across the races. Exposure to UV light, ultraviolet light in sunlight also stimulates the melanocytes to increase their melanin production. And the result is the suntan. And again, the skin does this as a kind of a protective mechanism against UV light. Um, many genes are responsible for skin color itself, but one single mutation, and that means one single base pair either being switched out or deleted or something else wrong in the DNA, one single mutation can prevent produ production of melanin and that can call, cause albinism. What's albinism? If you don't have melanin in your skin, what color will your skin be? White. Completely white. Um, so this is albinism. Question so far or interesting stories to tell? So in, I got a question real quick. So yeah. any, any race of people, they can have uh, albinism in them or does it come from a certain, a certain uh, race of people? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if albinism affects one race more than the other because it would just be a single mutation um, in the DNA. So yeah, it, it can affect all races and I don't know if it particularly affects one more than the other. That's a good question, Brian. I'll look into that. Okay, thanks. Very good question. Okay, carotene was that second main primary skin pigment that we listed at the beginning. It's lipid soluble. Um, when, it, when it is consumed, it can accumulate in the lipids of your stratum corneum. That, again, that stratum corneum is the outermost layer, most superficial of the epidermis. It can also accumulate in the adipocytes of the dermis layer and the subcutaneous tissue. And if large amounts of carotene are consumed, the skin can actually become quite yellowish. Um, so again, carotene is found in carrots, squash. I've heard stories of babies' noses turning kind of yellow or orange if they eat a lot of carrots or squash. I haven't witnessed that myself, just stories. Um, I would assume you'd have to really consume a lot of them to turn your skin yellowish or orange. Just like all right, so skin color, the color of blood um, in the dermis also contributes to skin color. And that's because um, just if you have more blood circulating in your skin, that would change your skin color more reddish. A decrease in blood flow that occurs in shock can make the skin appear pale or gray. And a, de a decrease in blood oxy oxygen levels content will produce a bluish color of the skin called cyanosis. Um, that's because oxygenated blood will look a little more reddish in color. And if you have a decrease in the blood O2 content, that can produce a more blue color in the skin. So cyanosis would be someone um, coming to the ER with bluish, a bluish tint to their skin, and you would probably be concerned about their blood O2 content. If someone comes to the ER and they're extremely pale or gray or ashen, um, so a decrease in blood flow, that could mean they're in shock. So again, these are great diagnostic tools, um, something that you can immediately see if someone's healthy. When a baby's born, you look at the color of the baby's skin right away to see if it's a healthy, uh, healthy birth. Um, subcutaneous tissue. So this subcutaneous tissue, the skin itself rests on the subcutaneous tissue. So we call the skin the cutaneous membrane and it will rest on the subcutaneous tissue. The prefix sub means under or beneath. The subcutaneous tissue is not a part of the skin. So we have two layers of the skin. Remember the epidermis, the dermis layer, this subcutaneous tissue is below the skin. We sometimes call it the hypodermis. It's attached to the skin. It attaches the skin to any underlying bones or muscles below it and it will supply the skin with all the blood vessels or nerves that are coming from it. Um, it is loose connective tissue. It includes adipose tissue that contains about half of the body's stored lipids. 
The amount and location of this adipose tissue can vary uh, with your age, your sex, your diet. Adipose tissue in this layer of subcutaneous tissue, it's one of its main purposes is just to help pad and insulate the body. It can be used to estimate total body fat as well. And here are some acceptable percentages of body fat. They vary between genders. So 21% to 30% for females, 13% to 25% for males is an acceptable percentage of body fat. And again, this body fat is coming from um, the subcutaneous tissue layer. So then we'll move on to hair. So we'll kind of get away from the skin. Any other questions about skin before, before we move on to hair? I'll just do a quick poll break on a scale of one to 10. How are you feeling about this information? 10, you're feeling really comfortable with it. One being you're extremely lost and it sounds like I'm speaking Greek. So you can just put that into the chat. A lot of this is basic kind of anatomy and I know you guys had your lab exam on some of these anatomical features of skin. So some of it might be a little review. All right, thanks for those numbers. That helps me see blank stares because I'm not looking at all of you at one time the way I would be in the classroom. Okay, let's get on to hair, which is also a part of your integument system, a covering. Um, hair is found everywhere on the skin except on these locations, the palms of your hands, the soles, the lips, the nipples, parts of your genitalia, and distal segments of your fingers and toes. So really hair covers everywhere except a few key locations. Each hair arises from what we call a hair follicle, and this will be an invagination of the epidermis that extends deeper into the dermis where it will start to grow. A hair shaft will be the part that protrudes protrudes above the surface of the skin. So that's what the hair shaft is. And the root will be below the surface and the hair bulb will be the expanded base of the root itself. So again, some of these words might be familiar um, from lab. A hair has a ha hard cortex, which surrounds a softer center, which is the medulla. The cortex will be covered by the cuticle, which is just a single layer of overlapping cells that hold the hair in the hair follicle itself. Hair will be produced in the hair bulb, which is down at that deepest layer of the hair um, papilla in the dermis. And the hair papilla will be an extension of the dermis that will be protruding into the hair bulb and contains the blood vessels. So eventually, we'll get to a picture here after we read through a couple more about the growth stages. Um, actually, let me, let's just go to that picture now so I can kind of explain what we were just talking about. So again, here is the hair bulb. This is the base of the hair root. The hair follicle will be the wall that surrounds the hair bulb. The hair root is just the part of the hair below the skin surface, and the hair shaft is the part of the hair that extends above the skin surface. The parts of the hair are listed here. Uh, the cuticle cell layer, the cortex is the harder layer, and then the inner softer medulla layer. And then again, the hair papilla will be an area within the hair bulb, which is that base of the hair root. And here's a more kind of in-depth, zoomed in area of the hair bulb itself and the hair root with the papilla. This will be the site of the hair cell division. So the hair will grow um, from the bulb and push its way up out through the surface of the skin. You can see the basement membrane, the stratum basale is the deepest layer of the epidermis. You'll see some melanocytes there as well. Um, so here's just a look at an in-depth look of the hair follicle and we'll go back kind of into hair growth here. Um, hair is produced in cycles with a growth stage and a resting stage. Just take a look at chat. During the growth stage, the hair will be formed by mitosis, and mitosis is just cellular division of the epithelial cells that are within that hair bulb. These cells will continue to divide and undergo keratinization. So they'll be filled with keratin. During the resting stage, growth will actually stop and the hair will be held within that hair follicle. And when the next growth stage begins, a new hair is formed and an old hair will fall out. So you're kind of undergoing this constant 
a cycle of hair growth and then hair resting and new hairs will be formed while old hairs will grow out. The duration of each stage will depend on the individual hair. So our eyelashes are different from normal hair on our heads. So your eyelashes will grow for about 30 days and then rest for as much as 105 days. Whereas your scalp hair will grow for three years and rest for one to two years. So again, the growth stage and the resting stage, new hairs will replace old hairs that will fall out. Uh, the loss of hair normally means that the hair is being replaced because the old hair will fall out of the hair follicle when the new hair begins to grow. So loss of hair um, can occur later in life. It can also occur due to hormonal changes. Um, I had a baby this summer and he's about two to three months old and I'm starting to lose all my hair, not all my hair, I won't go bald, uh, but different changes in your hormones if you've had kids or know people who've had kids can also affect hair loss. Hey, Professor, I got a question. So yeah. in the military, like some of the guys were getting like bowl spots, like literally bowl spots. Uh, it could have been a hormonal, like you say, but whenever they did the uh, injections, like steroid injections to stimulate the area or whatever, uh, it really didn't work at all. Um, it never worked? No. What kind of theory you got in your mind? So you're talking about how you knew some guys who were going bald, maybe due to stress or hormones? Yeah, I mean, we blamed it on the headgear because we got to wear headgear oh, all the time. Oh, sure. So, so just constant, like, rubbing up against? Okay. Yeah, but it was weird because it was literally, like, ball spots, like, just random spot in your head, and then it just had, like, ball spots. So I think depending on probably where the headgear was rubbing up against, um, probably that location was losing hair. But in terms of why the steroidal injections weren't working, um, I'm not sure about that. That's a, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know much about steroid injection to help combat hair loss, um, but that's a good question, Yasami. Um, why does, so I don't, that probably doesn't answer your question. Any other about that, Yasami? No, you can call me Reyes. Reyes, um, sorry, I forgot, yeah. You're okay. good, you're good. Uh, I don't know, like, we were, like, blown too like we were like okay well you're just gonna shave your head and just keep it like that you know <laughs> just make it even <laughs> but yeah, yeah. we're curious about that like, because everybody's like is it gonna happen to me you know type of thing yeah i know for men this probably affects the emotional aspect of losing your hair i think is hard um yeah i think well did when they stopped wearing their headgear did the hair grow back right no they don't well i mean you really never stop wearing your headgear i um, meant out of the military when you're done i guess oh i haven't i haven't had that test yet or okay. you know kind of like eyeballed it yet but uh everybody that i know that had that problem still learned okay thanks for sharing that yeah i'm not sure i yeah another way that people in the military probably sacrifice a lot including their their hair right so thank you for your service again um david why does hair rest from growing um it just hair growth in general just goes in cycles kind of the way your and all your cells aren't continuously replicating so every kind of cell in the body has a resting stage as well um sounds like alopecia yeah alopecia alopecia is hair loss in um and that can be stress related drew yeah all right Yeah, kids get it. So yeah, so kids will hit growth spurts in their teens and that'll be due to the release of different hormones like the growth hormone, um, testosterone, different hormones will be released during the preteen teenage years and that'll produce more growth. Um, and those hormones will decrease when you become adults as well. Thanks for the questions guys. These are great. I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in hair loss. I wish I was to answer all your questions, but these are great questions. I'm an expert in pregnancy hair loss. That's about it. Okay. Did you have a question, Brian? No, I was just wondering, just a random, random question. Does, uh, does all hair growth serve a purpose or is there like useful hair on your, or useless hair on your body? That's a great question too. I, I think in generally, general, you know, your hair is to help keep your body warm, like the layer. Um, 
also we'll see when you get goosebumps, you have muscles that are attached to your hairs. I don't, I think we'll get to that. That'll cause your hair to stand on end. So in terms of warmth, probably warming the body, um, also just recognition, recognition. I think, you know, I wonder if the hair just helps for you to recognize someone else because we all have different colors of hair. Yeah, some like yeah. random like, like hair on your toes, like what would that be the, what would be the purpose of that, just for example? <laughs> That's a good question, Brian. Yes. I don't know. Hair on your toes. Well, what about- I have a theory. What's your theory? Could, so, you know, when you get older, especially men, right? They start growing hair like in random spot that never been there before. Uh, I think as your body deteriorates, you know, your, your hair is actually starting making up for, you know, your, your warmth, your uh, receptors and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, yep, thanks for sharing. Um, what about your eyebrows? Why do we have hair there? What, do your, what purpose do your eyebrows serve? Well, that's definitely for your eyes. So it definitely is like a protection layer for your eyes for like sweat and things like so that. You have to keep sweat. What about your eyelashes? This is the same process, probably same like thing. dirt and things like that, yeah. So keep, your thing, keep yeah. things out of your eyes. So yes, I would say most of the hair on your body does serve a specific purpose. Hair on your toes, I don't know. <laughs> I'll look into that well, too. Great question. Your, your, so your limbs take longer to warm up. And, you know, like the blood on your, on your limbs is less than, you know, the rest of your body. So hair could be, a, you know. Yes, warm. hair. Yeah, hair, the general like layer of hair does help as a warming mechanism to your body and your limbs. Yeah. Good. Hey, I'll, I'll take that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, your hair color itself is also determined like your skin color by different amounts of melanin. Uh, with age, the amount of melanin can decrease, causing your hair color to become faded, which can cause gray hairs or white hairs, or the hair will can completely lose the ability to create more melanin and then it will become white. So that's what causes you to go gray or white. Each hair follicle will be attached to smooth muscle cells, and these smooth muscle cells are called erector pili muscles. These can contract and cause the hair to become perpendicular to the skin surface. Um, if you are scared under some sort of emotional trauma, these erector pili muscles, which are shown right here, they're smooth muscle, they can contract and pull the hair to stick straight up. Um, goosebumps, shivering, uh, so those are the result of the erector pili muscles holding the hair on end. Okay, then we'll get into glands and I'm just going to point out the first gland is the sebaceous gland. and I'm going to point out it's located usually right around, surrounding a hair because it'll produce an oily substance um, that your hairs need. So this is the sebaceous gland and we'll start talking about that first, but this sebaceous gland will be the one associated with the hair follicle. I think I pounded that into your heads in lab uh, to kind of tell the difference between some of these. Uh, so the major glands of your skin can be sebaceous glands or sweat glands. Uh, sebaceous glands will produce an oily sebum substance. It's a white substance rich in lipids. These sebaceous glands will be branched. Um, they'll be, most will be connected by a duct to the superficial part of your hair follicle. And the sebum will be released um, through a process called holocrine or holocrine secretion. And that, will, that oil just helps to lubricate your hair and the surface of the skin. Uh, it helps, it prevents drying out and protects against some bacteria. So that's the purpose of this oily sebum. And again, the sebaceous glands will be associated with the hair follicle. Uh, there's two types of sweat glands, eccrine and apocrine. The eccrine sweat glands are simple coiled tubular glands. They will really sweat by a process called merocrine secretion. Uh, eccrine sweat glands will be located in almost every part of your skin, but they'll be most numerous in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And they'll be, produce a secretion that is mostly water with much uh, fewer salts. Uh, eccrine sweat glands have ducts that will open directly onto the surface of skin. So they'll be coiled and the ducts will um, go up to the skin surface uh, through sweat pores. They'll help with thermal regulation. So why do you sweat more when you're hot? What's going on? Your body's trying to cool itself off. 
your body's trying to cool itself off. So you're sweating. You, these glands are producing um, more sweat or secretions to try to dissipate some of that heat that's trapped within the body is trying to dissipate the heat and release it to the exterior part of the body. Uh, sweat can also be released in your palms, soles, armpit, armpits, and other places because of emotional stress. So if you're really nervous, um, if you're scared, you can also start sweating in those places. Imagine if we had to open the mouth, kind of like the dogs do, to release heat. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So dogs have to constantly be panting. Yeah, releasing their, yeah. That, oh, wouldn't that, well, that would be just. That would be hilarious. Yeah. They're all panting like dogs. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, we don't have to do that. Um, the apocrine sweat glands, so this is the second type of sweat gland. First was the eccrine sweat glands, and this is apocrine. These will also be simple coiled tubular glands. Um, they produce a much thicker secretion, rich in organic substances. And these glands will open into hair follicles in the armpits, genitalia. Um, the secretion generally is odorless, but when it's released, it can quickly break down. It can be quickly broken down by bacterial action, which actually gives the body odor um, that we all, or some of us use deodorant against. Um, apocrine sweat glands become active at puberty because an in influence of different sex hormones. So again, apocrine glands produce more of a thicker secretion. It's organic in nature. Armpits, genitalia are the locations. It's odorless itself, but when it's released, it'll be broken down by bacteria and that can give it give the body odor. So here are the glands itself. Again, the sebaceous glands produce the sebum that help to lubricate and keep your skin and your hair from drying out. And here is an eccrine sweat gland. Um, you can see how it's coiled and it'll come up and be released to uh, the surface of your skin through sweat pores. And here is the apocrine, an example of an apocrine sweat gland. The apocrine, again, produces the thicker secretions, and the eccrine produces more of the more watery secretions. Questions on this? Okay, we'll move on to nails. One, one more question. Yeah. Uh, how, how come, in, like, we sweat, like, sweat, like, salty? You know, it's kind of like we actually have salt over the skin after the sweat dries up. Yeah, so that can be the body's way of excreting some waste products. So sodium chloride as a waste product would be excreted as sweat. Um, remember, that was one of the functions to release, you know, some of the waste products. So that's why some of your sweat, yeah, is salty. Um, depending on where it is, it'll be more watery. Like it said, it would be more um, in the soles and palms of your feet. It'll be mostly just water, but in other parts, it might be more salty. So definitely your intake of like food and stuff like that would change that. Yeah, I don't, would you sweat more salt when you eat more salt? I, I know it, it is a waste product. I'm not sure where the salt itself comes from, if it is directly related to your food intake. Um, I, think, I, I think from what I researched, it has to do with your sodium intake. So the more sodium you have, the more you sweat. So then I think what was... What I read was that if they, if you're sweating and you have so much sodium, it comes out kind of like a white that leaves on, on like a darker clothing. Yeah, you would actually see it. Yeah, I, I mean, I would assume that, that the more intake would produce more. But yeah, these are great questions, guys. And your body also uses the salt as a water retention. So as you sweat right. to release your water, you're going to release that salt that the body doesn't need anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. Good. Other questions, comments? All right, moving on to nails then. Okay, so your nails um, is a thin plate. It consists of layers of your dead stratum cornea cells. So again, the stratum cornea is the outermost layer of your skin, and there's also a layer of dead stratum cornea cells on your nail. Um, it contains a very hard type of keratin. So it's still, they're filled with keratin, but it's a different type that's extremely hard. The visible part of the nail is the nail body, which is what we can see. And the part of the nail covered by the skin is, this, is the nail root. So you have a nail root that goes underneath your skin and that's where the nails will start to grow. The cuticle um, is the stratum corneum that extends into the nail body and the nail root and extends distally from the nail matrix. So let's take a look kind of here at the nail itself. 
So just some external features, you can see the nail root will be below the surface of the skin. Here's the cuticle. The lunula will be the white kind of half-shaped, uh, luna shaped, half-shaped of the moon, and the nail body in the free edge. And then here is the nail matrix, will be the actively growing part of the nail. Here's the nail root underneath the skin, and there's your cuticle where the nail will stick out right underneath there. You can also see the bone of your finger and how close that bone will be in relation to the nail body. And then you can see um, a layer of hypodermis or fat surrounding the bone. The nail also attaches to the underlying nail bed, which is located distal to the nail matrix, as we saw in that picture. The nail matrix and bed are where your epithelial tissue is located with a stratum basale layer. And that just means that this will be the layer that's constantly dividing and giving rise to new cells that form the nail itself. A small part of the nail matrix called the lunula, that's that half-shaped moon-like structure, the white crescent-shaped area that can be seen through the nail body. And cell production within the nail matrix causes the nail to grow continuously. And we're all well aware of that. Your nails are constantly growing um, because we need to be snipping them off. So this is another picture of the nail. Before, uh, questions about nails before we get into some of the protection. Can I ask you kind of like a random question? I'm not sure if you know the answer. Um, but for okay. example, like my kids, they'll, they'll show me on their nails, there's like little white spots. Does that mean it's like a calcium deficiency? Calcium deficiency. So you can see the nail spots in the nail body, the white spots. Yeah, there, yeah there'd be like a random like white spot in the middle of the nail. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. But yeah, I, why did you go to calcium deficiency? Have you read about that too? Or? Um, I forgot who was mentioning that because I kind of mentioned it to somebody. Um, but when I was a kid, I used to always get like random white spots on my nails. Yeah, I, yeah, I would too. Um, I'm just going to make a note. I've kind of been keeping track of some of your questions because these are all great questions. So I'll look into that too. Um, yes, calcium right. deficiency. It, for nails. No, sure that's, that. no, I'm kind of curious myself. You guys are asking tons of good questions today. Well, you always do, but um, yeah, because that is common to see white spots growing throughout. I, I don't know if it is more common in kids, because I know as an adult, um, Google says mineral deficient. All right, thank you, Google. It means someone has a crush on you. Oh, <laughs> these are great. I haven't heard that one. Google, thanks for explaining that. Thanks for adding that to the chat, Michelle. All right, so the integumentary system protections. Um, they perform protective functions by reducing body water loss. Uh, this is important so that when you go swimming or you're just in general, water isn't seeping out of your body because water is a primary component of our bodies. Um, your integumentary system will act as a barrier that will prevent microorganisms and other foreign substances from entering your body. So your skin is really kind of the first line of defense against bacteria, other microorganisms. Your skin and all of the integument uh, structures like your hair and nails also protects underlying structures against abrasion. So your nails have a really important protective piece of them by protecting your um, underlying fingers below them. Melanin we talked about will absorb UV light and also protect underlying structures from UV light damage. Um, so melanin does that, but you're, it's also so really extremely important to wear sunscreen. Hair protection, maybe we'll figure out what all the hair in the body is good for. The hair on the head acts as a heat insulator. Eyebrows keep sweat out of your eyes that we talked about. Eyelashes will protect the eyes from anything foreign that might find its way close to the eye itself. And hair in the nose and ears will also prevent entry of dust and other materials. Um, so hair in your nose and ears, people are really quick to try to clean out nose hair and ear hair, but um, it does serve a purpose. The nails protect the ends of your fingers and toes from damage and they also can be used in defense situations. So sensory receptors. So we have different sensory receptors um, that are associated with the skin and these receptors are nerve endings. So they're um, connected with the nervous system and they can detect pain, they can detect heat, cold, and also pressure. 
although your hair does not have a nerve supply itself, there are sensory receptors that are actually around the hair follicle that can detect the movement of hair. Vitamin D production. UV light will cause your skin to produce a precursor molecule of vitamin D, and this precursor molecule will be carried by the blood to the liver, where it's then converted by enzymes. Um, the enzymatically converted molecule will be carried by the blood to your kidneys, where it's then converted again to an active form of vitamin D. And vitamin D is important because vitamin D will help stimulate your small intestine to absorb calcium and phosphate for many of your body functions. So we always connect vitamin D to calcium, um, but vitamin D specifically tells your small intestine to absorb calcium and phosphate. Calcium and phosphate are extremely important for many functions of the body. Temperature regulation. So how does your skin integumentary system help regulate temperature? Regulation of your body temperature will be important because the rate of chemical reactions within the body can be increased or decreased by changes in body temperature. Um, all of the reactions in your body happen by a chemical reaction and temperature plays a big role in this. That's why your body tries to maintain homeostasis, a consistent body temperature. Even a slight change in temperature can make the enzymes operate less efficiently. So um, extreme temperatures can kill off enzyme function and um, any sort of loss in the efficiency of these enzymes can disrupt the normal rates of chemical changes in the body. Exercise, fever, and an increase in environmental temperature tend to raise the body temperature. In order to maintain the homeostasis, your body must rid itself of excess heat, and it does that in one of two ways. So the first way we talked about sweating also assists in the loss of heat through evaporative cooling. So it will release uh, heat through the sweat, the molecules that are released through sweating. And your blood vessels in the dermis layer will dilate, and dilate means their diameter will become larger. Um, so think of a garden hose dilating to the size of a fire hose. That enables more blood to flow through the skin, and that just causes heat to dissipate from the body as blood flows through the skin in a more dilated or wider diameter blood vessel. If, and the opposite can occur, if body temperature begins to drop below normal, two things could happen. Heat will be conserved by constriction of the dermal blood vessels, so this will reduce blood flow to the skin. So if your blood vessels constrict or become smaller in diameter, that will conserve your blood flow or your blood itself to the trunk of your body, which is where your vital organs are, your heart, um, your lungs. You want blood, if you're in an emergency situation like hypothermia, you're in the mountains um, and you're there in winter time, your body will try to conserve the blood flow or the heat into the central part of your body or trunk around the vital organs. Less heat will be transferred from deeper structures to the skin and heat loss will be produced, will be reduced. And with smaller amounts of warm blood flowing through the skin, the temperature will decrease. Uh, I mentioned another way, it has enough to do with your skin, but your muscles will also contract very rapidly and you'll start to shiver to try to increase temperature. That doesn't have to do with your skin, but that will also help with temperature homeostasis. Homeostasis. So this is a Isn't, look at what. Oh yeah. Sorry, professor. Isn't another sign of uh, that about to happen when you have cramps too? Um, cramps in terms of like your shivering. Either, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, so and the heat time would be that you're like your water. You know, your body doesn't have enough water, but in the cold time, for sure, it would be signs of lack of heat for sure. Yeah, your muscles can cramp. So that's a whole other topic when we get to the muscle system. Yeah, muscles will cramp. Um, it's also can be due to a deficiency of uh, different minerals as well. So here's a look at heat exchange in the skin, um, showing how the blood vessel dilation will result in increased blood flow to the surface of the skin because they will dilate, become larger, and more blood can flow through. So heat will be lost through the epidermis. Um, blood vessels will constrict and decrease blood flow to the epidermis layer, and that decreased blood flow um, will try to conserve heat or conserve blood in the central uh, part of the body, the vital organs. 
Okay. Excretion then, and we'll talk a little bit about salt excretion here and sweat, like what it contains. Um, the integumentary system plays a minor role in excretion, which is the removal of waste products from the body. Um, so your body can excrete water, salts. It also can excrete other waste products like urea, uric acid, and ammonia. Even though the body can lose large amounts of sweat, the sweat glands do not play a significant role in the excretion of waste products themselves. Diagnostic aids. So this is when we look at the color of your skin and how it can be useful in diagnosing um, a patient or someone you might come into contact with a family member because it can be observed extremely easily because we can all see someone's face. So cyanosis um, is that bluish color to the skin and that's caused by a decreased blood oxygen content. It can be an indication of impaired circulatory or respiratory function. A yellowish skin color would we, we would call jaundice, and that can occur when the liver will be damaged by a disease such as viral hepatitis. Whenever you see the word itis on the end of the word, that means inflammation, and the prefix hepa has to do with liver. So some sort of inflammation in the liver could cause jaundice, and that could cause a yellowish skin color. A rash or a lesion, which is some sort of opening of the skin, that can be symptoms of a problem somewhere else in the body. Um, so keeping an eye out for rashes, lesions, jaundice, cyanosis. Um, also not listed here, but just the ashen gray color of your skin can be indicative of a shock victim or someone going into shock. Okay, burns. Um, we've probably all gotten sunburned before, but we're gonna talk about the different classifications of burns. A burn itself is injury to a tissue caused by heat, um, sometimes cold, friction, um, a rug burn, other chemicals. Um, if you've worked with chemicals and you're not wearing the proper protective material, you could get a burn from a chemical, electrical burn, or some sort of radiation burn. They're classified according to their depth, so how deep the burn gets into those skin layers. A partial thickness burn are classified as first degree and second degree burns, and a full thickness burn is a third degree burn. And we'll talk about, we'll look at a picture of how these burns take you through the layers of the skin. So a first degree is the superficial burn. It involves only the epidermis layer. This will be um, possibly a sunburn type burn. It'll be red, painful. It just affects the epidermis, that most superficial layer of the skin. There could be slight swelling or edema that is also present with a first degree burn. It can be caused by sunburn or brief exposure to a very hot or a very cold object. And they'll usually heal without scarring in about a week. A second degree burn, um, this is a partial thickness burn. This burn um, damage both, it damages both the epidermis and the dermis. So this second degree burn will get down into that dermis layer. If the dermal damage is minimal, the symptoms might just be red, pain, edema, and blisters. Um, so sometimes extreme suntans can become second degree and you might have seen blisters forming from an extreme suntan. Healing takes about two weeks and no scarring results. If the burn goes deep into the dermis, the wound can appear red, tan, or white, and it can possibly take several months to heal, and it might actually scar the tissue. A third degree burn is a full thickness burn. It damages the complete epidermis and dermis layers. The region of third degree burn is usually painless because the sensory receptors have all been destroyed. Third degree burns appear white, tan, brown, black, or deep cherry red. I think we'll talk about burn healing and then I just wanna show you this picture first. This shows you the partial thickness in a first degree and second degree burn and the full thickness goes deep into the subcutaneous tissue layers. Um, so these are the differences in first degree, second degree, third degree burns and how, again, that refers to how deep the burn gets into the skin tissue layers. The burn healing itself, um, any comments, concerns about the degrees of burns? So I've been exposed to the third degree. Um, it was some pretty uh, gnarly stuff. 
Like okay. the skin literally just detaches from your muscles. It's just free red. So did you lose all pain sensation, Ray? Because it was no. A so it was a it was a vehicle on fire, and then one of the guys got stuck, and like we tried to pull him by the arm, and then literally the skin just came off. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Something I'm sure you'll never forget seeing. Unfortunately. Uh, I mean, I guess you learn to deal with it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I can't imagine that. But extremely painful. How is that person doing? Do they? They're good. They're okay. uh, relaxing. They retire, medically retire, and then they relax. Okay. okay. Well, good. I'm glad you were there to help. And um, I'm sorry you had to witness that. But again, you, yeah, you definitely can see what happened. Yeah, this <laughs> I don't think so like your brain processes things like like so weird like the the skin and then the burning itself was like the least of my concern it was it was always like his life you know yeah so like every time something crazy happens it's, it's never like the gross part it, it's always like the life line part yeah wow thanks for sharing Ray I'm glad I'm glad that person is okay too um so we'll talk a little bit about how, yeah, your friend healed, and in general, how burns will heal. In all second-degree burns, the epidermis, including the stratum basale, where those um, initial stem cells are found, will be damaged. The epidermis is able to regenerate and form epithelial tissue within the hair follicles and its sweat glands, as well as from the edges around the wound. In deep partial thickness and full thickness burns, that takes a much longer time to heal. They will form scar tissue, um, with possibly disfiguring and debilitating wound contractures. So how do we treat burns and burn victims uh, to prevent complications of a deep partial thickness and full thickness burn and to speed the healing process, a skin graft will usually be performed if um, someone has lost or burned off parts of their skin. In a procedure called a split skin graft, the epidermis and part of the dermis will be removed from actually another part of the body and placed over the burn itself. If it's not possible or practical, practical to move skin from one part of the body to that burn site, physicians will actually use artificial skin or grafts from a human cadaver. Uh, so again, just another amazing realm of the medical world and what we're able to do um, medically to help burn victims. And this again is a look of the degree in burns and again they relate to the thickness layers of the skin. Okay, I'm just going to see how we are doing. We have a couple slides left where we'll talk about skin cancer um, and then we'll be done here. So we'll talk about skin cancer and I won't go on a soapbox too much but everyone should wear suntan lotion every day if you're outside. Um, skin cancer is the most common cancer. It's mainly caused by UV light exposure, so being out in the sun. Fair-skinned people are more prone to it. Um, my daughter is extremely fair-skinned. I don't know who she got it from, but she's extremely fair-skinned. She has red hair, freckles. Um, it's prevented by limiting sun exposure and using sunscreen. UV ultraviolet A rays caused a tan and they're associated with malignant melanoma, so non-cancerous. UV B rays will cause sunburns and sunscreens will block against both types of UV rays. Types of skin cancer, um, we have three kind of types, types here. Basal cell carcinoma um, is cells in the stratum basale will be affected. This can be cancer removed by surgery. Recommend tanning beds. Absolutely not. I would not recommend tanning beds. Um, oh, but yeah, please. Yeah. I just think about, you know, that was, that's the popular thing to do, go to tanning beds, but also it, using sunscreen, not going into tanning beds also decreases wrinkles later on and just, yeah, please take care of your skin. Um, squamous cell carcinoma are cells above the stratum basale that are affected. This can actually cause death. I really think people don't understand that skin cancer can cause death and kill you. They think, oh, it's some, someone, it, my cancer can just be removed by surgery and it'll be fine. 
Um, malignant melanoma will arise from melanocytes from a mole. This is a rare type as well. Um, this can also cause death, so it's important. I have a lot of freckles and moles throughout my body, and um, I go to dermatologists uh, on a yearly basis, and they check your moles, and you guys can do a self-check as well to make sure your moles um, aren't changing in shape or looking um, kind of elevated or darker in color, or sometimes you can put a line around the mole itself to see if it's growing in diameter. So all these are cancers of the skin, but just keep a lookout on the moles in your body or any other dark um, colors that appear or kind of different things that appear in your skin. And please get them checked out by a dermatologist. Um, I just recently had a, a friend of a friend who had melanoma um, and they thought they had gotten it all and then they realized it has spread to his brain and he has stage four brain cancer because it has spread to his brain. Um, so any, it's not something to take lightly. Wear, wear sunscreen, stay out of the sun, don't go in tanning beds. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thanks for listening. Um, so that's cancer of the skin. Most, uh, many times skin cancers can be detected early and can be removed. So I'm not trying to scare you guys, but just keep an eye out on changes in your skin um, and get them checked out by a dermatologist. Okay, any comments or questions about skin cancer? I'm not an expert on skin cancer. I just know you should get it checked out if something funky looks like it's changed. I do have two comments. It's kind of funny how you talked about drawing the line. <clears throat> That's mm -hmm. what they taught us to do while we are on the field, like in the middle of nowhere with bug bites. Yeah. And we don't know exactly what kind of bug was it. We just make a marker around the, the injury and then just give it a few hours and if it starts growing then that's when we start getting concerned. And then for people, when they burn, uh, I know you guys see a lot of TikTok and Facebook and stuff like that. People like automatically try to peel off the, the clothes of the skin. Do not do that. Just turn it off and look at the skin, make sure that the clothing didn't actually melt into the skin. So yeah, just be advised of that because you do not want to remove the, the clothes. Good to know. I hope none of us are in that situation, but yes, very good to know. Thanks for sharing, Ray. Any other comments? All right, okay. Then we'll talk about aging of the skin. Um, aging of the skin, blood flow will decrease and the skin becomes thinner with aging due to decreased amounts of those collagen fibers in the skin. Uh, there's decreased activity of your sebaceous and sweat glands, which make temperature regulation more difficult. It also, your skin might dry out more easily. Um, you'll lose elastic fibers or the number of elastic fibers, which will cause your skin to sag and wrinkle. Um, so different aging and the integument system. Um, I didn't realize I just, I'll share my, I'll stop the recording and then I'll share my epidermis story.